everyone, and welcome to How to Teach with Graphic Novels Online, Comic-Con at Home 2020. Next slide. My name is Meryl Jaffe, and I'll be your moderator. I work with Johns Hopkins University Center for Talented Youth Online Division. I teach uh, visual literacy and visual communication, and I am co-author of Worth a Thousand Words, Using Graphic Novels to Teach Visual and Verbal Literacy. And this is our agenda for today. We will uh, be introducing ourselves, telling you who we are. We will be making presenta presentations on how we teach with comics online. Hopefully there will be some time for some discussion and questions and we will be sharing resources with you. So I welcome everyone again and let me start with um, introductions. Okay, so I guess I'll start. Hi, everyone. Hi. My name is Talia Hurwich. Uh, I am a former middle school teacher from New York City. I'm currently a doctoral candidate at NYU. I'm studying graphic novels in STEM, in ELA, um, and I teach an undergraduate course in the philosophy of education, and we just started using Day Tripper in our curriculum, which is what I'll be talking to you guys about shortly. Uh, Rochelle, why don't, Rachel, why don't you go, go next? Thank you. Hi, I'm Rachel Cruz, and I am a lecturer at the University of California, Riverside um, in the creative writing department. I teach poetry and comics and comics poetry, and um, I've also recently been organizing an online literary festival um, called the Digital Sala, so I'll be talking a little bit about the work I've been doing there uh, via comics. Thank you, uh, Lauren. Yes, uh, I am Lawrence Tan, also known as LT, uh, 20 year uh, educator, uh, predominantly in Watts, Los Angeles. Uh, but now I'm currently um, at Roses and Concrete Community School, uh, teaching, well, the range of third through fifth grade. Um, and I'm also the STEM leader, but I also adjunct at Mills college and University of San Francisco. And today I will be talking about my practice with comic books, um, mostly online, but also um, some, some offline stuff as well. Um, so I'm gonna start sharing my screen, if that's thank okay. You. Oh wait, sorry, Meryl, did you? Uh, no, no, thank you, go okay. ahead, this is great. Okay, so I'm gonna start sharing. And okay, so in my um, short presentation, I'm going to talk about shortening the distance in learning with comics and more. And I, I'm going to phrase it that I, I, I have an ethnic studies approach to both online learning and, and youth culture in general. So um, some general tips about online learning. Uh, I've taught online, but to have your whole class online, um, and get hit with that was like a big learning curve as I was, uh, as I've shared in other spaces. Um, but some general tips I realized is that having a webcam makes all the difference, especially when you're trying to run other lessons that are not right in front of your screen, like art lessons or science lessons. Um, I teach uh, th the age range of third through fifth. And so understanding that the uh, average uh, attention span is about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, you can push it if you're really, really engaging, but um, you know, I, it's good to idea to just chunk up things and then not, and then not also just try to go through everything and um, not be afraid to stop and then come back at another time. Um, but if you, if the work is meaningful and engaging, then um, you, you can, you can push it a little bit. Um, and just like, I always say to my students, last time on Dragon Ball Z, every time I come back, I always recap um, for those who may have not joined that lesson. So I never leave uh, any of my students in the dust or some people might need a refresher and then move on. Um, and then a key um, distance learning tip, clutch learning tip is that having someone else to co-host, to help you moderate, uh, to help you, um, pick on participants and or uh, whatnot is good. And, and then you also have to let go of the micromanagement. Uh, I know some folks um, that I and some of my colleagues tried to use distance learning um, as if it was like the regular classroom 
if a kid's out of out of you know um, fooling around on the on on screen they have to like nip it in the bud but it, you got to remember that everyone's developing a culture together and so until that culture is is uh developed this new culture um the mute all is your friend the <laughs> the video off control is your friend sometimes uh, instead of making a big deal someone's distracting to the to the group you just turn their video off real quick um and just being able you know just having that kind of thing and so with that being said um the main thing is talking about comic books and, and why that's important uh, both online and offline uh, my major pieces are developing literacy skills um and engagement connecting and extending cross-curricular um things um and developing this is my big one developing critical thinking analyzing and problem solving skills. And then it's also a, a, a space to open up the creative design and production piece. And so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. But again, I said I, I, I come at things with a, an ethnic studies approach um, using decolonized racial social justice lenses and pedagogies and frameworks. So a lot of what I'm gonna talk about actually has been done in this month of May since um, it's been a big, big month of May. And so a lot of that has been online, but I will show some context of things that happened that built up before, but I, but it can be done online as well. So um, I took this intro quote from David Walker from Black Comics Returns, and basically um, he states that he couldn't read the words in comics, but the pictures drew him in and made him want to read, uh, learn how to read the words. And the idea of that uh, comic books offered these realities uh, that were far greater than what he had experienced in day-to-day -day life. And so those are the kind of things that I draw upon uh, for my students who I, you know, pre predominantly serving black and brown youth from marginalized communities. Um, it brings back this, uh, this uh, idea of Paulo Freire's uh, Brazilian sociologist able to read the word as well as able to read the world. And my students analyze this all the time. And we, we, we develop our skills to be able to critically read the world and also apply it to being able to read the word as well. Um, so, but when doing that, you know, I, I, coming from an ethnic studies, social justice background, there's a lot of things I want to deep dive into, but I've realized early, especially with music and other youth culture things that you, before you get into that, you've got to meet your students where they're at. And so when, when dealing with comics and, and any kind of topic in general, um, we start with where they're at. And, and because of Marvel Comics Universe, um, you know, Marvel Comics, Avengers has been blown up. And so we start with things that they like and we add tools to have them critically analyze and go through some of these processes. Um, and, um, and it's more palpable to them because it's like, ooh, yeah, I, I like that movie. And oh, I like to read the comics. And so let's talk about it. And when you do that, then, then you can complicate things, right? And so in 2018, my student was like, why are the majority of heroes a particular skin color and have the same body types? And so we can deep dive into bigger uh, things, right? And so um, also on that note, um, we can look at older comics and, and, and break it down. And um, so using that as a medium to be able to discuss higher level um, discussions is it just makes that entry point for the students and the engagement right there and so by looking at what people are learning from comics from this medium um we can enter we can entertain discussions heavy discussions without being able you know and then we can introduce higher level words but they can they can uh, participate in these type of discussions and subject matter um, so, for example, uh, May was uh, uh, Asian Pacific uh, Islander Heritage Month, and we discussed a lot about the anti-Asian sentiments due to the COVID, uh, COVID pandemic, right? And we looked at um, some cartoons, and, and we talked about Japanese internment. We also talked about the Chinese Exclusion Act, all these things through that, that lens of comics. Um, and I, I put a bunch of Dr. Seuss things, uh, anti-Japanese internment camp, um, a pro internment camp type cartoons for them to analyze. And then I bring it back to a, a proverb that we always talk about in, um, in our class about an, an African proverb, a proverb that talks about the lion telling their story. Uh, unless they, they can tell their story, the, the, 
the hunter always is glorified, right? And so what does it mean to give your voice and, and put your word out there? And so we recently, um, these are some of the kind of tools that we start to deep dive into, you know, once they're ready for some of the material. And again, as a, as a teacher of, of younger students, you pick and choose what you, what you want. Now, um, I had uh, purchased uh, the, the, they call this enemy on, uh, on my Kindle, right? And I screen share, a screen share online and we kind of deep dive into the in, into Japanese determined. This is from uh, you know perspective of of George Sakai, and and his experience in an internment camp. We kind of juxtapose that right. Um, and a lot of times we just look at the images and the words. We have discussions on it, and then we kind of read aloud with each other on that. Um, I've also done uh, I am Alon Alfonso Jones. Um, and we touched a little bit upon it uh, because we ran out of time, but especially also in May, um, we had a lot of, um, you know, unrest and protests and demonstrations over um, our, you know, black lives and our young folks. Um, and so, again, this is a good uh, text that I've also purchased uh, uh, on Kindle so that I can screen share it so that we can um, access it um, online. Um, I recommend um, looking it up, uh, Lee and Low Books or leeandlow.com. They have a, um, a teacher guide that I, do, I don't necessarily use, but I, I've used it for some, some suggestions and they have a list of resources as well. And that to, to be able to talk about things that my students experience in their real lives and their realities. Um, an extension of that, we've also, um, because of analyzing comics and looking at features of, um, of things, my students have learned to use Photoshop and other programs um, to create images and signs that they, they made for posters and whatnot. Um, it was an extension activity that my students can do online. Online, they use Gravit.io um, or Canva.com to do some um, to design. And so even when you look at comic books and how things are placed, lettering and um, even covers, that goes a long way with being able to create the action part of some of the things that we're talking about. Um, another example is um, I did a brain break. And uh, after you know, a 15, 20 minute segment, we took a brain break and I, we did a quick art lesson on how do you make your letters, how do you embellish your letters? And then so we, we took uh, BLM, Black Lives Matter, and we, we kind of were doing that. And so my, what you see on the, the left-hand side is my students work and they were, they were tasked to kind of finish up their, their posters, say what you want to say, and that turned into a poster that was used in, a, in, in participation of a rally. And then my other student um, using um, some of the same similar techniques that um, we, we taught online for um, action steps. So um, some of the resources that I've used, um, teaching tolerance, social justice books, I said Lee and Lowe. Um, but I'm really into the, the black or the ink net right now and, and really deep diving into just like identity through comics. Um, and so I've been using that as a resource as well. Um, but real quick, um, I'm also always on the lookout for the, the, the Kickstarter, the, the Indiegogo gems. And this is one thing that I've just purchased that I've been, I'm going to be using with my classroom, um, which is, it's like a mix of, of uh, Avatar The Last Airbender with African folk tales. And so my students are going to really, um, we're going to use that online um, because I have it on, on digital uh, PDF. And so I can share that with my students. Um, but um, one thing I really want to say, and I, I'm going to wrap it up, um, that again, remembering the tale of the lion hunt, um, we all, I'm always pushing produ production, right? Tell your tale, have your voice heard. And so um, a lot of the things that we do online or offline, it's all about producing our own, right? And so we do a unit which will be coming up um, uh, soon for fifth grade that they create their own uh, comic books uh, based on, you know, their lives and lived experiences. Um, and so here's a sample of a former fifth graders piece of work. Uh, but we've also taken it to the next level where now you're, we're using, we're steamifying everything, and we're using uh, Tinkercad, which online to design 
their 3D models and action figures or statues. We use, like I said, Gravit IO to create their, their cover designs and logos, um, using GarageBand to create theme songs and the robotics piece for all their accessories and um, devices for problem solving. Um, and then um, we, we digitize their, their, a couple of their pages through uh, Scratch um, and Google CS First uh, to, to kind of give them that online, you know, it's online, everything's online, but they get to, to make things matter. And I think that's what's important. How do you make the work matter? And um, so here's a, examples of them doing things, but we were able to earlier this year to make it matter by hosting a convention style um, community STEM night. And uh, in the pictures, you see them using little bits and the circuitry um, and the hero kits to um, kind of do that. And so it's really about what, what are we learning? And, and so uh, online or offline, like if, if you can make learning meaningful to the youth, then they'll be um, engaged and ready to go online or offline. So online, I, I had constant people pushing me to make sure I made it on time or I was early because they wanted to know what's the next lesson. And so also, lastly, I just wanna say it can't be isolated work. Um, let's, let's continue to build my email, my social media. And I'm slowly um, caving in and starting to put stuff on teacher, pay teacher, but if, if folks hit me up, I, I don't mind sharing, so. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lawrence. That was really awesome. That was great. And next up is Rachel. Okay, thank you again, Meryl, for organizing this. Um, Talia and Lawrence, it's really great um, to be on this panel with you. I um, teach at the college level at University of California, Riverside in Southern California, and I'm also um, an adjunct at Orange Coast College. Um, I find that K through 12 teachers are way more innovative <laughs> than college instructors. So I'm learning so much from um, all of you today. Um, I'm also the author of Experiencing Comics, an introduction to reading, discussing, and creating comics. And um, today I'll talk a little bit about making zines and I'll talk a little bit about experiencing comics. Next slide, please. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> so the first day that classes were canceled was on March 12th, 2020. Um, I teach English 119 at Orange Coast College and it's an introduction to creative writing. Um, in this class, it has three components. So there's fiction, poetry, and comics. And this was the slide from one of my, my first online class. Students obviously did not sign up for an online class and I did not sign up to teach an online class. So all of us, and we came up with a set of community guidelines to talk about flexibility, to talk about experimentation and failure, and just learning as we go, including me. I think most especially me. And so a lot of what I'm sharing today, um, it's based on my experiences teaching online. None of this is, is like fully refined. It's not, um, you know, I've taught creative writing for about eight years at the college level, but um, I'm fairly new to teaching online and, and student engagement online. So um, I'm here, I'm mostly here to learn and, and share a little bit of what I know. Next slide, please. Um, so I believe this will be aired in July of 2020. We are currently recording this in late June. Um, it's still a pandemic and I'm still learning. And as I was typing out this slide, my cat jumped on my laptop. And, and so a lot of um, my teaching online has just been rife with distractions and, and improvisation and, and meeting students where they're at, which Lawrence pointed out. It's like, I, um, I can't control what my students do and that's okay. And um, a lot of my students toward the end of May into early June were actively protesting for Black Lives Matter. And so um, a lot of them did not show up for the final sessions of our classes. But um, just keeping in mind that we're all doing our best, we're, we're all, um, you know, we're living in a pandemic, we're living in a global civil rights movement, and we're living in a huge moment of unemployment. And so um, this moment has really helped me to, to recognize the humanity in my students and in myself and, um, and to take more of a holistic approach as, as we, as I teach and as we engage with each other. 
So just a couple of practical tips um, for online student engagement. Um, there is, if you use Zoom, I've found that the breakout rooms on Zoom allow for small group discussion. And a lot of my students liked this component of our classes. It allowed them to talk one-on-one -on -one, um, in the class with another student, and it felt like a small group discussion that they'd have in person. And um, in the student evaluations, a lot of them brought that as a highlight of the, of the class. And um, the cool thing about the breakout rooms is that as an instructor or the host on Zoom, you can kind of dip in and out of those breakout rooms and, and sort of um, chime in, listen in on what the students are talking about, um, help guide conversations. And it really allows for students to um, break out of that lecture mode if you're spending a little bit of you know, your, your lesson on lecture. It allows them to kind of ask questions and, and process um, what's been presented. Um, in my comics section of my creative writing class, um, we've been able to do collaborative drawing over Zoom, and there are different kinds of, um, and I think you can do it on Zoom, but there are different um, apps and websites where you can give students access to, to actually use their, use their cursor and draw and collaborate with each other. And so that um, has been a really fun way to kind of break out of just the sort of passive watching you know, a lesson um, on the computer. Um, for the comic section, oh, if you could just go back really quickly. Um, we've, um, the students engaged in comic scripting and drawing interpretation. And what that looks like is we read 30 Days of Night and um, um, Bitch Planet by Kelly Sue DeConnick and Val Delandro. And one exercise I gave them was to write an epilogue to each of those comics. And so what they did was they took a comic script and they wrote one to two pages of an epilogue. And then in the small breakout room over Zoom, they would read out their script um, and scare, uh, screen share it with, their, um, with their, their partner. And then their partner would draw it out just based on listening and looking at the actual text. And so it allowed for this moment of um, deeper, meaningful uh, listening um, and engagement. So they're, so they're listening to this um, comic script and, and finding ways to imagine that and visualize that um, on, on paper. So during the pandemic, I've seen comics used as a tool for processing social distancing, um, the disproportionate effects of COVID-19 on black and brown communities. Um, for example, The Nib is a great web comic that um, tackles a lot of these current events. And I've seen um, cartoonists um, discuss and unpack the current Black Lives Global Revolution. Um, I've also seen um, comics as a means for creating community and connection with distant friends and strangers. So not only in the classroom um, are we unpacking and learning how to um, write comics, read comics, and engage with our, our um, with each other on on the medium of comics, but um, I've been able to fold in what's been happening with creators themselves and, and how they're, they're processing um, all of these different issues in their work. So I am an organizer. In addition to teaching, I'm an organizer with the Digital Sala. And the Digital Sala is a, an online um, Philippinex literary festival, but it sort of evolved um, past the month of April. We, a couple of um, peers and I, writers, poets, um, other organizers, we've created this literary festival to kind of stay connected with each other, to share each other, share work with each other. Um, but we wanted to make this festival decentralized. We wanted to um, go, you know, we wanted to expand on different kinds of genres. I'm a poet and uh, I'm a poet and writer myself, but I wanted to hear from cartoonists and I wanted to hear from speculative fiction writers. And so we created this festival and we got to ask um, Malika Garib, who wrote I Was There American Dream. She's Egyptian and Filipina. And we were able to organize, um, I think it was 75 um, people over Zoom who created um, recipe cards. They were these postcards, um, illustrated postcards about their pandemic comfort recipes cent uh, centered on Filipino food. Um, so it was this beautiful, um, conversation, sharing of work, and Malika was able to use both her computer 
um, to present her work, but also she had her um, iPhone and iPad to, um, you know, show how she was drawing, you know, show uh, and engage with everybody um, in terms of what she was, what she was, um, what she was drawing. So it was able to, she was able to model that work with everybody. Um, so I've also been taking a look at Sarah Merck's zines. She's been writing a zine a day for the past year. And she wrote this zine called Passive Voices for Cowards, um, a life and death grammar lesson. Um, and she has essentially talked about the use of passive voice when in, in news media and talking ab about um, the murders of um, black people in this country and around the world and how passive voice diminishes um, the actor in a sentence. And so these kinds of zines, um, these kinds of quick comics allow for um, immediate um, response and interpretation to, to the current event. Um, just as a quick resource, The Believer magazine has been putting out comics workshops, I think, every week. And um, last week they did a comics journal with Ebony Flowers, and today they're doing one on comics as resistance. Um, so these I've just seen all over the community, online ways to access comics. So I, um, this, this past quarter, I've been able to in, encourage my students to make zines. Um, their zine stands for magazine, um, but they're, they're very do-it-yourself. Um, on the left-hand side, side of the slide, there's um, just a quick um, instruction on how to make zines. Zines are easy and cheap to make. They're low stakes. You don't need to have. You don't need to know how to draw to make one. I do not know how to draw, but I've made like many many zines on um, teaching. They're handmade, which I think is so important. It allows students to have that tactile approach um, to comics and to kind of take um, a break from the screen. They're experiential and they give students insight to a cartoonist decision making. So when we're doing, um, sometimes in a class, we'll we'll trace. Um, another cartoonist's work to kind of get a sense of their line, get a sense of, again, how they tell a story through images. So I love this idea of bringing the, the handmade online. So you can make a zine with your students and zines can encompass a variety of assignments like summaries of the graphic novels you're reading as a class, character sketches or reimagining of these characters, Textual analysis where the students can use an avatar of themselves, a la Scott McCloud. So Scott McCloud uses himself in understanding comics. And so they can kind of create their own avatar and um, using themselves as a way to explain or process some of the work that they're that that you're reading as a class. Um, I think I just have a little bit of time. Um, I want to quickly peruse experiencing comics. Um, <clears throat> and I won't go um, really in depth into the <clears throat> excuse me, into the book, but um, if we can move to the next slide, please. Um, experiencing comics um, includes spotlights and interviews with over 30 cartoonists, creators, and comic scholars who are working in the field. Um, and I just wanted to give a sense of, um, for example, Ashanti Fortson is a web cartoonist. And so um, in the book, I highlight a lot of folks who don't have printed work, but you can access them for free online and students can do so as well. Um, here I had, um, I have a spotlight with John Jennings, who's a cartoonist and him and Davian Duffy adapted Octavia Butler's Kindred. And, um, and for this book, I really wanted to not only um, present representation of underrepresented and diverse creators, but to really um, have them speak from their own experiences and talking about the craft um, of, of making comics. Um, in experiencing comics, um, I also focus on um, a textual analysis uh, procedure and process called notice and focus. And, um, and I won't get into this since we're, uh, we're out of time, but um, the book itself, it focuses on critical race theory, gender and queer theory and, and intersectionality. And so as I'm using this book, I fold in these different lenses in order for students to not just look at the work through a creator's perspective, but through these other um, perspectives, these other lenses. Um, okay, so I'll end with this. Um, you know, this is a time where we are um, amplifying 
black writers and voices and I think this should be happening all the time. Um, Tanika Stotts wrote and edited Elements Fire which was kickstarted and won an Eisner Award under the anthology category and she says we need diverse creators not just diverse books and that's definitely um, something that um, I've been continuing to work on in my own classrooms and I hope that's something that you're all interested in um, and want to do as well. So that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. I appreciate it. Um, Talia, it's your turn. All right, great. Um, so I am here. This is me, Talia Hurwich. I work at NYU, where I also teach undergrads. And to give you a quick background about this course, it's a philosophy of education course titled Learning and the Meaning of Life. Presumptive, absolutely, but it gets students. Um, and so we've kept the title. I, it is a 100 student class uh, and it teaches philosophical concepts and ideas by engaging in the great books and how we find meaning in our lives. Um, some examples are, we talk about the importance of asking questions by reading Plato or the concepts of non-action when we read the Tao Te Ching. Um, and the last text of the syllabus this year was Day Tripper. It's a comic by Fabi Moon and Gabrielle Ba. It took several years to get this into the syllabus and I was extremely excited to bring it into the classroom to discuss how we live life, even if we might never know what life is about. Um, and then this whole thing happened and with COVID and the pandemic, a whole slew of challenges came up. First of all, attendance was plummeting. It's NYU, there's a huge international population. And because we had to move online, we could no longer guarantee attendance and, or we, we could no longer enforce attendance because we had students in China and New Zealand and Japan, and we were not going to require that they tune in to a lecture at three o'clock in the morning. So what started out as a 100 student class started to whittle down and down and down. And by the time that we hit, you know, the day tripper, um, there were probably about 25 students in attendance for the lecture itself and everyone else was watching the recording of it. It means that you don't get that feedback from students immediately and you have to predict what they're going to need, which is tricky because this was the first time you were gonna teach a comic in this class. Um, and many educators, have spoken about this in the past, myself included, um, comics require specific skills that you need to know and you need to apply. And if you're not getting immediate feedback or visual feedback from students on that, how do you know that you're actually needing them? Um, and then the other thing, which is just kind of obvious, I think to a lot of us who had to move online, we have no control whatsoever in reducing distractions um, from the students and their lives. We take so much time to look at the classroom and try to model it so that it works just right to encourage conversation and all of that. And the second that a kid is, or a college student, is in front of a computer screen and there's a whole house around him or her, you know, moving around and doing stuff, it's something that you have no control over whatsoever. And so these were my solutions, or a handful of my solutions. First thing that I did was I started creating anonymous Zoom polls. Um, it's NYU, we had Zoom. And basically what I did was before you start teaching, you pull, put out a poll. It's completely anonymous, so there's no judgment whatsoever. I don't know who's saying what. No other student knows who's saying what. You share it immediately and you start to gain, get the temperature of the classroom. Um, what I would do is I would resend this poll immediately after the class as well. And that gave me also immediate feedback of how well I did, how much more handholding needed to be done, and if I needed to follow up on anything. Um, on Zoom, they have that technology available. Um, um, I suspect you have to pay it for a certain level. Um, but you can use Google Forms as well. You can use other online survey programs that can do this. Another thing that I found was direct students focus. Now, you probably noticed 
that the format of my slides between talking about the challenges in my solutions have changed. Before I was really kind of reading off of the slides, there wasn't, there was a fair amount of text on the slides, not a lot of color. We have here much more limited text, a lot more color. You have to pay attention to what I'm saying to really kind of understand where I'm going. Um, and I found that that was very useful in running classes. Um, there wasn't as much frustration. There was less, there was less to be distracted from. So this is a slide that I used in my class. This is from Day Tripper. Um, and I used it to get into conversation with Plato's Apology. Um, so basically this is a moment in the story when after a cataclysmic airplane crash, hundreds of people die. And this character, Jorge, is right now talking to the protagonist. And he's about to disappear. He's about to leave his friend's life for a fair amount of time. And the reason being is he was on the plane. And he says to his friend, it could have been me on that plane. And for what? No job is worth dying for. So I wondered what is, right? And then he breaks ties and he's gone. Now, I took this. This is only a fraction of the original page. I took this, I put this slide up. I had them focus on this. And then I asked students, okay, now compare this to Socrates. Socrates said the unexamined life is not worth living. Do you think that's the same thing? Now look at Jorge's face in that bottom panel. What are the emotions happening? Do you think that's what Socrates might have been feeling? By and large, they said no. And then the follow-up question is, does that make a difference? And so you start talking about what does it mean to be uncertain about life? And what does it mean to ask questions about life? And what about those like real world issues that get in the way of being that philosopher who's asking all of these questions and at the end of the day, we're just people. Now, I think that graphic novels are really good at this because of this use of color, because there aren't many words on a single page. It's very easy to zone in and zero in on the image and on it and just draw focus in a way that copying and pasting a paragraph of text isn't quite as useful in that way. Um, and students really reported back very positively about being able to use images to kind of keep them on top of the flow of that lecture. And then the final thing that I wanted to mention, because we're running a little bit short on time, um, the nice thing about being online is that there are multiple forums and multiple layers for having a conversation going. Um, the favorite thing, my favorite thing was, uh, we were talking about, <laughs> we were talking, this, this was not specific to comics. Um, we were talking about Kant um, and what morality is. And we were talking about this, the example of Les Mis, the, you know, you are starving, you see bread in a window and do you steal it? And my students started getting into this fantastic conversation about, okay, if it's a baker and you're stealing a baker's livelihood, you know, that uncertain. What if it's Walmart? Um, and it started getting really heated and time was running out and I had to move on from there to get somewhere else. And I said, you know what, this is fantastic. Continue it in the chat. And it did, and it was fantastic and amazing. And I told all of my students that you can download that chat after, you know, along with the video and they should. Um, and so online, you're able to have a lot of simultaneous things happening at once, which allows for a lot of different layers of learning to reinforce each other's experiences. And I felt that it was worth mentioning. I'm not going to necessarily go into the outcomes that much. Um, I will say that students did follow more easily with the comic because those images, because the limit of text did zero them in as we see. Um, and even though there was more on a page to analyze, that is there was both text, content, ideas, image, not just you know, the content, but the method that the content was being delivered, we actually ended up being more time efficient as well. Um, 
again, like everyone else, um, this was the process of transitioning a brick and mortar in person class to an online environment. There are certainly things that I've learned from this panel. There are certainly things that I am continuing to learn. And I really do look forward to these continuing conversations as we continue to build from there. Um, but that's basically it for what I have to share. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Talia. And thank you, everyone. This was incredibly informative and so rich in information. I can't thank you enough. Each, each one of you gave such awesome points and, and, um, and resources. I added a few here. This is just for teaching graphic novels. Here are a few resources. I, I won't go over them because we're running out of time, but they're here on the slide. You enjoy them. Here are a few um, additional resources. I think Talia, you added them, so thank you uh, for resources for, te for online teaching. And I know that, and Rachel and Lawrence, you also included resources in your slides. So, so thank you very much. I have been teaching online a program course for years. Uh, and it was all there in front of me. You guys kind of like, ah, I gotta teach online. And you did such a great, you just, I loved, I, I loved that how you all shared how this is a learning process. And not only are your students learning, but you are learning. And I certainly learned a lot from this. And while I had a whole bunch of questions to ask you guys, um, I, I think we have one or two minutes left. So I will just ask one, one question. Um, and that is, what benefits have you experienced teaching with comics online, since this is all about teaching online with comics? Anyone? <laughs> Uh, should we start, maybe I should just start with Talia first and then we'll just in, in a minute, in a few seconds, what are the things that you learned about teaching with comics online and the benefits of it? Yeah, sure. Um, I think again, a lot of it was, I liked that they were focusing. Um, I liked that there was a sense of immediacy to some degree. Um, I liked how easy it was actually to go over a text together. It's really easy to copy and paste frames and or share a page, um, you know, via screen share on Kindle. Um, it's overall just much easier to handle than a paragraph of words. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Lawrence, uh, Rachel, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, it's... Quickly? Honestly, yeah, <laughs> me personally, it's easier to have uh, a screen on versus having the actual books out, so it's a little cheaper for me. Um, but yes, the engagement piece um, is definitely uh, amplified. Thank you. Uh, Rachel? Sure. Um, I use a... Um, it's an online series called Strip Panel Naked. And I used it online. And the cool thing about it is that we were able to pause different frames. And this YouTube series basically unpacks different comics and different, um, you know, comics, uh, different themes and craft elements. And so it's been neat to sort of direct everyone's attention to those specific frames. Thank you. Um, Ty, would you just include the last frame just for a moment, please? If you can, I know you're, can you get to the last? Uh, keep going. Oops. Okay, never mind. Um, if we can't get it, I bet there it is. I just want to thank everyone for visiting with us. If you have any questions, comments, or you want to continue the conversation, I know Lawrence included his email, but I can always, mine is on the bottom, and I can always refer to you, Rachel and Talia, as well. So please feel free to contact me either on my website, MerylJaffe.com, or my email, JojoJaffe at Gmail. And as we all said, let's continue this conversation because we're all learning, it's all new. This is such incredible stuff. And these panelists have such great resources. Thank you, thank you, thank you, panelists. Thank you all who are watching.
and I look forward to the next conversation. Thank you. Thank you.